That's all, Stan. Any uh, requests that anybody wants to make? Brother Gary, could you lead us in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wonderful love, your mercy and thy amazing grace. We thank you, O Almighty God, that you sent thy only begotten Son to die, to take away all of our sins. We're so thankful for this opportunity this morning. Father, that we can come before thy throne through the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, you are surely welcome in this place this morning. Father, I pray that you will set our, set our spirits free, that we may worship thee this morning, that we may lift up that name which is above every name, for there's power in the name of Jesus Christ today. Father, we remember these prayer requests this morning, Lord, that unspoken request. Father, for this family today that is in mourning today, that has lost a mother and a grandmother, Father, we pray that thy spirit would be with them. And those that have your spirit today will be able to comfort this family today, Lord. Father, I pray for those that are not with us today. We remember Brother Francis. We remember Sister Faye today. We remember Brother York today. Father, I just pray that thy spirit would have a free course today. Father, that you would meet the needs of your children today. Those that may be discouraged, O oh God, I pray that thy spirit would move, that thou would lift each one up today, Lord. For we are so thankful today, Lord, that the sun is shining in our hearts today. You have delivered us from darkness into thy marvelous light. And I pray, Father, today that you would have your way. Bless the people, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Brother Paul has volunteered to lead the song service this morning. I would encourage each one to put a little extra effort <laughs> in your worship and uh, just enjoy the presence of God. He said he would be faithful. He said if we showed up, he'd show up. Yes. I'm traveling on I'm traveling on To a city I have inside I'm a traveling on I'm a traveling on I've heard the truth And 
Never 
Praise the Lord. Well, down this road, I can see a bright light shining for me. It's far away, but the pull is strong. But someday this old road won't seem so long. And when that morning finally gets here, Twenty-seven of the blue book. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. What key would that be in? Here? Go ahead, you know it.
on him. Anyone else got a number? In the same boat? hard to stay in the center of his will and the old flesh wants to go contrary to to what the word says yeah just like Paul said he'd have to die daily and bury himself and certainly walk of a Christian life and I'm speaking for myself is 
I guess. Like that old saying, wasn't the promise of a rose garden that's uh, times at times it's you're going through thorns and getting all scratched up and but he knows how much we can endure and I was talking to Nikki during the week and uh, there's been times when you realize all there's left is really him and nothing else matters and you get down on your knees it doesn't matter where you are I remember working for a gentleman picking strawberries and I'd been going through a big struggle and up in the wee hours of the morning and praying and and I just knelt down right there in the field, not even where the strawberries were being picked, and there was multiple people there picking berries, and, and he met me there. Yeah. We serve an amazing God, and it's all what it's about at times that we completely surrender to him. Yeah. Has anybody else got a number? Or Eli, would you have a song to praise the Lord? Just wash away Oh, the 
just confirms with me that the Lord is, he knows. And oh, I'm, I feel so, sometimes it's hard for me to contain because I, I feel like I want to run, I want to shout, I want to scream, I want to <laughs> just praise the Lord. I want to give him thanks because, and thank you all for the prayers for Justin. He went in for uh, a follow-up this week and he had called me very excited um, he did this MRIs and he got the best possible result that he can get. The tumor, it's, it's, it's still there, but it hasn't grown. And that's what they were hoping for, that it wouldn't grow. And there's no more tumors. And I just want to thank him. And I want to thank him that Elijah sang that song. I want to thank him that Josh is here this morning. I just want to... I just want to praise him and worship him and just say thank you. He's, like, he's such a wonderful God, and I'm so, so, I'm just so excited. Just so thankful. As Eli was singing that song, I was just thinking the importance of the blood. And his word and his commandment. And I was just thinking, what a serious hour. 
that must have been to have made sure that that blood was on the lintel outside of those doors that night. I follow his instruction to the letter. This kind of makes me think that for these past almost 30 years now, that at times I perhaps distant myself and not seriously taken what his word says as it is it is it is written and it's certainly a serious thing that the Lord put it there for a reason I was just thinking as he sang that song there was that peace knowing that blood was there and the, those angels were just going to fly right on by and I just think how many times I failed him through the years and still knowing his word but yes his grace and his mercy and the blood he sees me through that blood amen Joyce you got a song Just slow chorus.
Jenna, do you, do you have a song? testimony what about sister Monique uh, you got a song
anybody have anything uh, this morning? Gary and Kathy, would you have a song? Oh. All right, maybe at this time we could the time to uh, Ray. Praise the Lord. I really thank God for his love for our little beautiful child. She's been such a blessing to us. And on Monday, we had an appointment, and she, uh, we had a hearing appointment. There's another lady. She had another, uh, a daughter only three days early, born three days earlier than her. And she said that she hasn't been able to sit up, only because she was born with her skull being fused. And her daughter has to go for a surgery to, re- to help her brain grow so that she can grow. And I just ask you to pray for this little Robin. I don't know her mom's name, but I noticed that her daughter's name was Robin. And I just ask you to pray for her. And that the surgery goes well and that God helps her to grow. Yes. And able to sit on her own. Yes. And help the, mo- the mother to have confidence and, and faith that she'll that she'll be okay. Yes. Yes. We can all stand, maybe. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your wonderful faithfulness to us, your mercy and your grace, Lord, that has followed us all the days of our lives. Heavenly Father, as we look into the Word of God this morning, we just pray that you would inspire it to our understanding. May we glean some truth for our journey. Help us inspire our minds to say something that would be accurate and bring honor to Jesus Christ. We commit this time to you, asking you once again to use it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord is good. We're thankful for the reality uh, 
if the Spirit of God did not move upon your life uh, and quicken the truth of the gospel to you, it would just be a story. And the world looks at it as a nice story. It's a beautiful story. But unless the Spirit of God meets you, gives you a revelation of the reality of it and your relation to it, it it's again just a story. So it's a wonderful thing that the Spirit of God uh, ministers to us. He's a good God. He is not against us. <laughs> he is for us. Uh, Jesus said, If any man serve me, him will my Father honor. That is a remarkable thing. If any man serve me, him will my Father, the invisible, eternal creator, will honor him. And as we said last week, we should seek to get our honor from God, not our honor from one another. And that's easy to do, to be buddy-buddy with each other. And uh, if any man serve me, him will my Father honor we started a uh, thought, uh, the living word, the living word. We'll just continue with that title. Uh, I'm glad to be here once again this morning. <laughs> Who would have believed? <laughs> uh, the Lord can do marvelous things. He don't do always the miraculous, although he can. But he can turn things around uh, kind of in a slow curve. <laughs> and when you look back, you know that it's, it's different. Anyway, uh, I'm thankful for the Lord for the opportunity just to serve him just to be part of the body of Christ, just that alone. It's like Brother Jim used to say, it's enough to make you dance. Just being a part of the body of Christ. Uh, if any man serve me, him will my Father honor. Uh, without Jesus Christ in the equation, there is no spirituality. He is the highest representation of the invisible God. You cannot overrate him. Uh, you cannot worship him too much, and you cannot honor him too much. Uh, he's, like the song says, he is our all and all. Ten thousands of angels worship him. <laughs> How much more us living sinful critters. Uh, he is wonderful. I'm glad to be part uh, of the plan of God. Uh, I've said many times, it would be a miserable life if you don't have a firm place to stand. If you don't understand the will and the plan of God for your time, it's not a good place to stand. It, there's a certain nervousness to it. There's a certain unknown to it. But God can give us a firm place to stand, something that's anchored within your soul, uh, that's unshakable, that's unmovable, and it's invisible. <laughs> it's not visible to the natural eye. It's only visible by spiritual Revelation. As I said earlier, the story of Jesus Christ is a beautiful story, but unless God quickens it to your understanding, it's just a story. And <laughs> he's alive and he's real. I preached a pretty good sermon this week in my in my mind.
So we'll see if we can <laughs> bring that back. All preaching is, is telling you what my thought life is. That's all it is. And if it's accurate, it should minister to the body of Christ. It should have a lifting effect. This is why I've said so many times, uh, we do not need the movement to criticize us. We need the movement to stand with us. There is absolutely no, nothing in my heart against the movement. We need them to stand with us so that they can minister to the body. The beautiful thing of the plan of God is that he can deal with you as an individual. He can deal with you in your own life, your own set of circumstances, your own mentality, your whole outlook. He can deal with you. But the beauty of that is he gets intertwined in that, in your thinking, and he allows you to express him in your own simple way. And none of us express it the same way. But that adds a beauty to the dimension of it. Does it not? If you hear someone say a, a, a testimony, and uh, you might have heard someone say it in a lot more flowery, <laughs> dramatic way, but that still adds a dimension to it. Having said that, this is why I say to the movement, you, we need you to stand with us because they can add a dimension to it that I can't add it. That's not me. How many understand the beauty of all of that? It, it ministers, the body ministers to itself. And God has the members there to do their part. Come stand with us. I say that to the movement with all sincerity. And we're going to get at something, the Lord willing. I was thinking, I, I've, my mind is kind of caught up on it. Uh, David. David, the scripture says, was a youth, <laughs> had no military training. Uh, and you know the situation he got caught. He was bringing some supplies to his brothers, his older brothers. And Goliath uh, come. And Goliath ranted and raved and cursed the God of Israel. And the armies of Israel backed off. So David comes innocently to bring some supplies. And the scripture records a little statement says, David heard it. He heard Goliath. Why would the Holy Spirit take a position in the Bible that David heard it? Of course he heard it. But he heard it in a different way. When he heard it, a revelation of the will of God formed in his mind immediately. Not five years later or 20 minutes later, Immediately, something rose inside of him. This guy is, is coming down. I don't know how. It doesn't matter how. So where my mind went, there was a little hesitation. <laughs> there was a little time period. David goes to his brothers, and he pleads with them, is there not a cause? The Lord, and, and if I can make, put it, in my own words, David was saying, the Lord has given me a revelation. And he tried to share it with his brothers that should have been standing with him. Did they hear him? Things have never changed. And David, with that revelation, when you read the whole story of it, there was something in David was unconquerable. When he had that revelation, he, when you read the account of it, 
he didn't back off. It said he hasted toward Goliath. And I'll say again, I don't think he completely understood how this guy is going down, but he, he didn't have to know. And this morning, I, I'm trying my best to minister what the Lord has put on my heart, and I don't need to know a whole pile. I just need to be faithful to what God put in my heart, and the rest is... We are not that important. We are not. No, there is virtue only in Jesus Christ. There is no virtue in your personal holiness. There is no virtue in your particular lifestyle. The virtue is only in Jesus Christ. And we're just sinners. <laughs> On our best day, we are sinners. So. But God has chosen to work with us. If God has chosen to work with us, at least we can do is work with him. According to this. God don't work. I was talking to our brother in Norway, and he mentioned something that my mind kind of dwelt on. Uh, Lucifer in the prehistoric time as he influenced the animal kingdom. Because animals are, in, they behave on instinct, they don't necessarily have a free will like humans. Lucifer's ability to, to promote evil was limited. But when man was created with a free will, his potential for evil was multiplied. How many understand that? The most deceptive spirit on the face of this earth is the spirit of Antichrist. It is so deceptive that it would deceive the elect if it were possible. And if that is true, then it has to be exposed, does it not? Isn't that just common sense? Who wants to fellowship the spirit of Antichrist? Nobody does. So if that spirit, which is the most deceptive spirit on the planet, is the way it is, it needs to be exposed in 2018. So, <clears throat> let's just go to John. John chapter 10. Very briefly, uh, a message of this this sort can go in many di different directions. There's a lot of information you can feed into it. Uh, I just want to uh, shorten it. Uh, just lately, um, we used the word, we looked at that scripture when John introduced the Son of God, he introduced Jesus, John says, we beheld his glory, the glory as a, of the only begotten Son of God. And we brought out the fact that the glory is, wasn't looking at the physical man. The glory was in the words he spoke. And when Jesus prayed... <laughs> In John chapter 17, he, he prayed to the Father and said, The glory that you gave me, which was the living word, it was the reality of God, the glory that you gave me, I have given to my disciples. 
And he says, that they may be one as you and I are one. So the glory of the Son of God, the Word of God in the season has been given to the body of Christ. That's really what that's saying. Where I'm going with that, that glory is in the Word of God. It's in the revealed Word. Also, when we recognize the Word of God on ground, that fresh, living Word of God, it's a heavenly place. I want to include that in what I'm going to say. It, it's not a natural environment. It's a spiritual environment that recognizes the Word of God. And the Bible calls that he- heavenly places. When God, God's Word meets the earth, there's nothing normal about that. <laughs> So, for the sake of where I'm going to go, that is a heavenly place. When you receive the Word of God by revelation, that is a spiritual... Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom lives inside of us. And that kingdom is invisible. It's only viewable by spiritual revelation. So that is a heavenly place. That is what it is. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to lay a little groundwork. Um, John chapter 10. Let's just pick it up in verse 24. This is the element of people that should have been standing with Jesus Christ. They should have been supporting him. They should have embraced what he had to say. Here we have the pure Son of God, sinless, harmless, filled with the Spirit without measure, and they've got nothing but contempt for them. That is a poor testimony of humankind. It is, really. So here, here in verse 24 it says, Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. So listen to what he says. Jesus answered them, I told you and you believe not. Because it's only by spiritual revelation. Just because somebody tells you something, it has to be a reality to you. It has to be a spiritual revelation. The beauty of it, it always connects to existing revelation It always fits your spirit comfortably. It is not contradictory. It's not hard to embrace. We receive it immediately. That's So Jesus said, I told you and you believe not. Because it could not be that man standing in front of them. That Jesus fellow from Nazareth could not be him. So they would not open their minds to receive it. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. That is a powerful statement. If I am a sheep, I'll hear Jesus Christ. I won't have a conflict with with, with what he says if I'm a sheep. If I have a conflict with what Jesus says, it's a sad sad state of affairs. And Jesus has not stopped talking. He's still, in every generation, he's got something to say. And... My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. 
And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And when he said that, the spirit that was motivating the Jews exploded. Because Jesus Christ was so in line, so committed to the mind of God, there was no difference. When you dealt with Jesus Christ, you dealt with God. Because he was totally motivated by God. So you turn him down, you're turning God down. That's basically what he is saying. And... Jesus said, no man is able to pluck them out of my my hand. And the thought that come to me, the hand of Jesus, when he holds you, there's blood squeezing out through his fingers. There's blood running down his arm and dripping off his elbow because he holds you because of Calvary. And God cannot bypass (laughs) If... In order for God to condemn you, he has to condemn his son. So that's how great this salvation is. If I am born again with the Spirit of God inside of me, God cannot condemn me. (laughs) Because Jesus holds me in that blood. I love that song. In order for the enemy to get to you, he's got to walk through the blood. So it's just a wonderful dimension of the whole plan of God. So he says that, and he said, Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone you not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written... In your law, I said, ye are gods. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. And that resonates with me. The scripture cannot be broken. What is recorded has to come to pass. It has to have a fulfillment within the plan of God. Say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I, because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works that ye may know, and believe that the Father is in me, And I in him. Jesus went as as far to say, you can hate me all you want. Maybe my personality is, is a bit shaky and you can hate me. But you cannot hate the words I'm, I'm speaking because I'm speaking God's words. And that's a beautiful thing. Hebrews... Hebrews Hebrews chapter 12 Before I go there, uh, bearing fruit, we looked at that different times. John 15, bearing fruit for God. The world, the religious world, looks at bearing fruit as being a good guy, of helping your neighbor, uh, all the good things that life throws at you. You should just be a good guy and do all the things that we know to do, the golden rule, all of that. 
the world looks at that, the religious world looks at fruit as being your behavior. But your behavior and that type of fruit doesn't stand the test. It, it doesn't. Because when the Roman army was surrounding Jerusalem in 70 AD or 69, I'm a good guy. Wouldn't cut it. But if you obeyed what Jesus said, Jesus said, if the army is there, you head for the hills. You leave the city. And I can imagine those old Orthodox Jews, God won't let that happen. God is going to deliver us. And they can quote the scriptures. But the word of God said, you leave the city. And it was the worst catastrophe that Israel ever faced, that Roman army. The, the Jews were so stubborn they held their ground that there was loss of life that there should never have been if, if, they'd, if they'd obeyed what Jesus said. Anyway, uh, so my lifestyle, my good works, doesn't mean anything against that. It's the Word of God that has to have the preeminence. So bearing fruit... It's not just a good lifestyle. And everybody should have a good lifestyle. But it, that's not what it's at. Because I can have that and deny the word of God on every turn. Fruit is you receiving the word of God for your time. Standing for it. Dying for it. Ministering to the body of Christ with it. And all that is incorporated within that word. How many understand? That's true biblical fruit. That's what fruit is. The other is nice. Everybody likes a nice guy, but it don't cut it. In fact, the nice guy thing is very shallow compared to the fruit that the Word of God will bear in you. If you allow it, that's why I say to the movement, come and bear fruit of the Word of God. Never mind this nicety thing. Bear fruit of the word of God. Stand with us. Minister, help us carry this forward. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Um, Thursday we started at verse 18. And, and we'll go there again. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. In the natural, when God dealt with Moses... The mountain was an awful sight to look at. It burned, it smoked, it shook. And the children of Israel said, Look, Moses, we'll talk to you, but don't, we don't want to talk to God. Let God talk to you, and you talk to us. Because it was a fearful situation, a fearful sight. And the writer of Hebrews says, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched. We've come to a spiritual mountain. <laughs> We've come to a spiritual dimension. We've come to a spiritual kingdom. It's invisible. It's only visible by revelation as God would reveal it to you. Verse 19 and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. So all of the manifestation of it uh, scared the children of Israel, and they just wanted to deal with Moses. 
for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. So even Moses, who was receiving the word of God, there was a, a fear, there was a, a, a respect for the word of God. And I can say to the movement, there has to be some fear inside of us for the word of God for our time. That word of God has to have priority over everything. And that should create a certain fear in us. It should not be that is just your idea, that is you're trying to make a name for yourself, and all the same things they said to David. David's brother says, we know how naughty you are, and you told the story about the lion, and you told the story about the bear, and you, we know you just made that all up, and uh, you're being naughty. Was David being naughty? David had the living word of God inside of him for that day. And they should have supported him. But you know how all that plays out. Verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. So it's a spiritual thing that God has brought to us to. It's not, it's not a physical something you can view with your eyes. It's a spiritual kingdom. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Verse 25, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. And we know that that's referring to Jesus. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, referring to Jesus... Much more shall they not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. So when Jesus was on earth, it was, a, it was a kind of a point where they were still under the law, but they were coming in, into grace. So it was a narrow spot, we could say. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, if they escape not that didn't obey the voice that he spoke when he was on earth, how much more if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? Now, now Jesus is in heaven now. We are fully into the grace age. We have the Holy Ghost. There is no excuse for not receiving the words of Jesus Christ. And, and at that time, there might have been a little <laughs> bit of an excuse because it was a pivotal point going from law to grace. But the writer of Hebrews is saying, now that Jesus is in heaven and speaking, we're, we're just not going to escape if we do not receive them words. And history... <clears throat> Whose voice, verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And where I'm going with that, is in Moses' time, when that manifestation on the mountain, it was a physical shaking, the mountain, and all of what you could view with your eyes. But... The writer says, I'm not only going to shake the earth, but I'm going to shake heaven. And how we have to look at that is God is going to shake that spiritual realm that 
that is inside of you and, he, you and me, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, God is going to shake that. And when you look at history, history tells a beautiful story if we'll look at it. When God brought Martin Luther on the scene, and at that time there was only dark Roman Catholicism, it infiltrated everything. And we know the whole story of that. And at that time, the Catholic Church had monasteries, nunneries, and all of that all over Europe. And in the monastery, they lived, quote, unquote, a holy life, separated themselves, be, was really poor. <laughs> That's really spiritual. You know, wear sackcloth and ashes. Yeah, that's really spiritual. And all of that. So Martin Luther comes on the scene with justification by faith. And the Catholic monks could have said, Martin Luther, now we're in heavenly places. We're in the plan of God. Well, when Martin Luther preached justification by faith, it proved that they weren't. Did it not? Did it not do that? The present day word that Martin Luther brought exposed the spirit of Antichrist that they were not in heavenly places. Did it not do that? This is how I'm looking at it. And all through time, you get to the turn of the century. The, the denominations that were formed at that time, Baptist, Nazarene, Pentecost, all of them, we're in heavenly places. Then here comes Azusa Street. Oh, that's of the devil. Did that word of God not expose the spirit of Antichrist that was controlling the denominations of that time? Did it not do that? Were they in heavenly places? They were not. And I'm not talking about the individual. I'm talking about the spirit that incorporates uh, the thing. So the shaking of all things, you can look at it through time, but the full manifestation of it didn't happen until 1963. Shaking heaven, because the seventh church age messenger was on ground and was finishing up his work, which God ordained that he should do. So part of the ministry of the seventh church age messenger was to restore all things. So he took all of the doctrines that were scattered all through Christendom, put it into one message, and presented it to the body of Christ, and there was an element of people that recognized that. The full gospel businessmen and different ones that supported the seventh church age messenger, Brother Branham, when he started handling the word of God, they pulled back. Did that not expose the spirit of Antichrist? It, that's the shaking effect of the word that is shaking heaven that's what that is it's not shaking the earth it's shaking heaven that dimension that spiritual dimension that we're looking at so in 1963 when he preached the seals the revelation of the seals it <laughs> i've got a lot of things going on in my mind but i want to wrap this up when he preached the seals, here we have a simple hillbilly with grade five or six education talking in very simple terms. No, no excuse for not understanding what he says, but the religious world absolutely rejected the revelation of the seals. Did it not shake the religious world? It automatically does. The religious world didn't... Billy Graham put out his version of it, but it doesn't hold scriptural water. It, it, it's just an idea. Anyway, 
Not only did it do that, the revelation of them seals shake the religious world, but it also gave the bride a little inkling of the time frame she was in. Because the fifth seal was revealed that it was the Jews under the altar. That was, there was a representation of the six million Jews slaughtered in the Second World War. They were represented under that fifth seal. So that gave the bride a little inkling of where she was in time. And that, if we want to look at it right, that opened the door to the first watch. Because the Bible says that they were to rest for a little season. So that little season can't be over 100 years. Because if we understand biblical terminology, it cannot be past 100 years. That's a known revelation of the scriptures. So it gave the bride uh, an understanding of where she was at in time, and it created an expectation inside of her to watch for the coming of the Lord. That is your first watch. Isn't that simple? And it shook the religious world. That revelation, that that's what it does. So, when Brother Branham was taken off the scene, I, I don't know where to quit. When, when Brother Branham was taken off the scene, the shaking didn't stop. <laughs> the spirit of Antichrist still had to be exposed because, as I said earlier, it's the most deceptive spirit on the planet because it, it incorporates itself into Mother Teresa, a goody-goody behavior, and all of that stuff. It, that does not hold water to the Word of God. The Word of God always has preeminence. So when God takes the prophet messenger off the scene, we all, all know what happened. <laughs> The Branham Movement says, we're in heavenly places. We are in the glory of the Word of God. And all of that thinking. So God raises up the apostolic ministry. And may I say this? The apostolic office, the office of an apostle, is absolutely necessary in the body of Christ or it ain't going nowhere. It is where headship and the work of Jesus Christ kind of defines the will of God for your time. That office, that's what it is in the New Testament. So when God brings that office on ground... It exposes what remained in the Branham movement that we're praising God and we got the word. <laughs> and I've come in contact with some Branham people, nice people, but Brother Branham said, and Brother Branham said, and Brother Branham said, well, it goes nowhere. They don't understand what he said. They just quote and quote and quote. So all I'm saying is that's ministry of the apostle formed the second watch. A watch is a spiritual revelation of how you view the coming of the Lord. Because without that revelation, you don't know where you're at. So when that apostle was brought on ground, it revealed where we were in time, what the word of God was saying, and, and dealt with a lot of things. So it was a second watch. That second watch shook the first watch. Is that, a, is that an accurate statement? So here we are in 2000, end of 2004, God removes 
Brother Jackson, that occupied that office. And the movement of Brother Jackson, we're in heavenly places. We got the word of God. We're Indiana. We got the word of God. But everybody knows the, re- the up-and-coming ministry went into a lot of false stuff. The people that had a vision, had a revelation supposedly, could not stay there because for obvious reasons, for history just repeating itself. So we know that we are in the third watch. And if we've been listening, that third watch is producing a revelation inside of you whereby you are viewing the coming of the Lord and it's producing an expectation. It's producing, actually what it's producing is what David had. It's the living word on ground and it has a quickening effect. It has a exactly like David had. (laughs) It's amazing. It's just, this is why I say to the movement, don't get caught up in each other. Come stand with the word of God. Help us minister to the body. And as I said earlier, the incredible thing about it is if they would open their minds, they could have a benefit for the body. They wouldn't have to stand against it and say, well, they're off and they're all of what goes on with that. I'm talking very plain here this morning, but there is no meanness in what I'm saying. There's no bitterness. There's no, I say, come help us. Don't criticize it. Help us. Like you should have been helping David. Who, uh, verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken. And that is the purpose of the word of God, to remove those things that are shaken. If I am shaken by the word of God, I need to be shaken. Because I will not serve a purpose in the body of Christ in the final analysis. So, as the things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we, verse 28, receiving a kingdom which cannot be be moved, and that can be translated shaken. We have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The word of God should not have a negative effect on you. It should build you up. It should put you on fire. It should rejuvenate you. (laughs) That's what it should do. If, if you're receiving it by revelation and you're recognizing your position in it and your place in the body, it does that automatically. It, it doesn't have to be pumped out of you. You can get up tomorrow morning, blue Monday, and just be on fire for God. I remember all the years that I was a milkman. Monday mornings was a long day. I had to get up a lot of time, one o'clock, whatever. But I can remember them times doing home delivery. Rogers come with me different times. And just rejoicing in your heart. I didn't go looking for that. It's an automatic uh, byproduct of the Word of God. Let's, let's quit. I'll ask the musicians to come. Can we just sing that one 
it's a, it's a chorus it come to my mind this week. I haven't, we haven't sung it for a long time. I heard a million voices praise the name of Jesus. I heard a thousand trumpets or something. How does that go? Does anybody remember how that goes? If we don't, we'll sing something else. Telling the story how he came to earth to die. I heard a million voices praise the name of Jesus. Singing in God's choir. together to worship you, to magnify the name of Jesus Christ. We just pray now, Father, that you would dismiss your children with your blessing. Give us traveling mercies. Draw us closer to you day by day. Dismiss your children now with your blessing. 
the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You are.